so many exceptional people in one room. It's quite a gift to be here, I'm telling you. So I'm going to ask some intro questions, and uh, hopefully y'all will you'll participate. Um, how many people have access to information about your family of origin? How many people here in the room? OK. That's, that's most folks. How, how many folks have access to information about their birth, their physical birth? OK. All right. So, so we'll do a mixture here of, of things for people who can know these things and then how to work with biology when we don't know these things. And what I'm going to present, of course, is just the path that I was fortunate to discover. I know everybody here is on a path that's, that's working for them and that their biology and their consciousness are like doing the dance, right? Everybody's here because that's what's going on for them. Um, this path for me that we're going to talk about tonight, it helped get rid of some of those rough edges in biology, you know, those little pesky rough edges. Um, so so let's, let's do this one here. How many people, when you first wake up in the morning, your inner dialogue is, welcome to this world. <laughs> we, have a, we have a few hands going up, a few hands going up. Yeah, fortunate. So let's all turn and, and resent these. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah, well, they get the big start on the day, don't they? Yes. And so, so one of the things I learned, and uh, we'll go into the science part of it, is that when we wake up in the morning, it's one of the times when our biology brain, this little autopilot that's installed by the time we're one year old, the programming is set in the womb and in the first year of our infancy. That little autopilot program starts running when we wake up and it basically repeats what happened to us at birth. It's going to do a video replay of what happened at birth. What were the first words I heard at birth? Now, this is the program that's going to run until we reprogram it. Once we reprogram it, we can have something different playing. But until that happens, we actually have a loyalty to continue that because we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that dialogue. So whatever that dialogue was when we popped out, how many people were not born in a hospital. You weren't born in a hospital. How many people? Okay, I see a couple of hands. Yeah, home, home births? No? <laughs> All right, so something, something kind of natural. Yeah, okay, so for the rest of us, our birth was a Western medical event. Our own parents <coughs> did not believe that they could go through the process of childbirth without Western medicine being there with them. So just kind of kind of feel that. Like think about being a, a pregnant mom, right? And you're in the womb. And she goes to see the doctor, right? Something that biology has never really done before. <laughs> it throws a little wrench in things, you know? And, and we don't want to do judgment here. We, you know, whatever arises, love that, right? So here we are. We lo love everyone, love ourselves, love everyone. And we love exactly how it happened. And we also love that we can change it, right? So if I'm not happy with the little dialogue that's running when I first wake up, 
why not hand that back to the doctor, to mom, if dad was there, hand it back to dad, and say, please look friendly on me when I develop my own dialogue, one that I like, one that feels welcoming to this world, instead of a medical evaluation of my well-being. And that's what most of us in a hospital get. It, that's just the way it is. So, how many of you, when you first wake up in the morning and you walk past your first mirror, wherever that is, how many of you look into your own eyes and have a sense of, I love this person? How many? Okay, we have some hands here. Yes, yes, yeah. And so, remember, once again, at the birth, a person will be loyal to the first look they get at birth until they reprogram it. So, what is the first look? Squirt goo in the eyes, stick a hose down the throat, count the fingers and the toes, stick a needle in the leg, you know, take away from mom, wrap you up, do an evaluation. So, for decades, I woke up, go into the mirror and don't even think about it, I'm doing an evaluation, making sure all my parts are there. How are they looking, right? <laughs> and it is one way to start the day, you know? And, and then there are other ways to start the day, which I have discovered are more enjoyable <laughs> for me <laughs> than doing a medical survey. Uh, and it's just a loyalty to what happens with us at birth. So, for those of you who know about your birth, great, we'll talk about some of that. And if you are a parent, or an aunt or an uncle who knows about the birth and the labor and the pregnancy, or if you're a grandparent and you know about that, I'm telling you, you can do a huge service for the people in your family. Um, I may not be able to find the form. I have a form and you can see it on the website. It starts nine months before the conception, from conception to birth, and then up until one year of age, and has all the months there. If you can just write down what happened at those points, if anything significant happened, I promise you, your children, your nieces and nephews, a whole bunch of their thinking is going to change. I, I actually sent birthday cards to my three children having a picture of me and their mother before they were conceived, a birth picture and a picture of them at one year of age, and telling them honestly what happened that were the big events. And what that led to in their biology isn't that interesting that people have actually worked out what each part of the body would say if it could speak English? Isn't that something? I mean, we didn't do that when, when I was in school. It's, it's not bad or wrong or anything, but let me just show you two of the books here so that you all can uh, think about purchasing these. My main instructor was Jobert Renault or Gilbert Renaud, as we would say in Southeast Texas. And uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave, leave. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Raised Southern Baptist in Beaumont, you know, what are you gonna do? So, uh, and I'll leave these out for y'all to take pictures. But these folks have written in here, what does it mean when I get a sore throat? What would my sore throat have to say about what's going on in my life? Right? And, and of course we can just take something for it and that's really good. I like being comfortable. I'm not above taking something for comfort, but there's something really satisfying about having a conversation with a sore throat and it just goes away. It's like satisfied that 
okay, you got the message, we're good here, right? We, all of y'all, I've talked to a bunch of y'all in here, you're already in that, you've done that. I just didn't know if you knew that it's all kind of cataloged. So let me tell you one of the original stories. This is, this is this an inspiring story for me. There was a, a cancer surgeon in Germany. How many of y'all know Dr. Hammer's story? If you watch some of the YouTubes, you know. Yeah, okay. So Dr. Hammer's son gets wounded, serious wound. He tries for three months to keep his son alive. He's an expert doctor, but he fails at that. And his teenage son dies in his arms in the 1970s. The way our autopilot works, this is how the autopilot works. And I, I'm gonna just take some liberties here with the story. So let's say I'm Dr. Hammer and this has just happened for me. My autopilot is watching to see if I'm missing stop signs. It's watching to see if I'm looking both ways when I cross the street or am I obsessing in sorrow over this thing that I cannot face and be with. And so he was in a place where he could not face what was going on in his life. So one night during our sleep, and all of us had this happen when we were little kids, you know, like somebody took our lunch money and we thought the world had ended, you know, or our, our first little girlfriend we had a crush on started liking somebody else and, you know, I just, I don't wanna be here anymore. And, and then we go to bed at night and the autopilot takes that suffering out of the brain and puts it down into the body. And that takes the psychological suffering away to a large degree and it allows me not to walk in front of a bus. That's how it's calculating. If I walk in front of the bus, it's over, right? That's not good for biology. So the autopilot sends it down into his body. Six weeks later, he's diagnosed with a testicular cancer. He's never been ill in his life. He goes to the place, a room like this, guys with testicular cancer, a very specialized place. And guess what he discovers when he's in the waiting room talking with these people? Everybody there has just had a child die. Now, he's never heard of this before. And he went to medical school. And he practices in this. Never heard this before. So what he does, just on a hunch, is he does a CAT scan of his own brain and sees that there's an abnormal area on his brain that was not there before and it's in the area of the brain that operates the testicle. So he checks with the other guys. Can I do a CAT scan on your brain? Yes, uh-huh. They all have the same abnormality in the same place. Now here's the interesting part. When they grieved and processed the death of their child or someone or something they loved as dearly as a child, when they went through that process, he could watch the abnormal area on their brain scan shrink. And when it got really, really small, the brain started sending normal signals to the testicle and the cancer went away. It's kind of a big find, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, how many times have you heard in your life, well, you know, son, you'd really be somebody if you could find a cure for cancer. <laughs> Isn't that right? And that's, that's the big thing, right? If you could find a cure for cancer. So here's this guy, he's discovered something. Now he's a compulsive German. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at scientific German, but these guys are serious when they take notes and compile data. So he starts working on this and he does serial CAT scans of the brain in 40,000 patients over a 40 year period, right? And gets a 92% reversal 
of every illness, autoimmune, cancer, no matter what the person has, once they get the conflict, what the conflict is about, face it, go through it, however they do it, the brain doesn't have to send all that suffering down into the body because the person processed it. So now it just comes out. So anything I can tell from my heart and my words, my body doesn't have to tell it. But if I can't find the support, if I don't have the tools, my autopilot's gonna send all that stuff down into my body and it's wonderful enough to send it to a body part where we have clues about it. So, here's the other piece we don't get told yet. When the brain produces the testicle cancer on purpose to save me from psychological suffering, a testicle cancer in the beginning actually makes a stronger sperm than normal testicle. When the brain makes a breast cancer on purpose, it makes a more nutritious breast milk than normal breast tissue. His brain was trying to help him have a super son to replace the one who died. And just, just sit with that for a second. See if you can feel that. Like, so I'm gonna impersonate this a little bit. And, and so Dr. Hammer's here, and I'm the doctor, and I've got his chart, and I've got the biopsy results. It's what we were afraid of. Yeah, you're likely gonna lose this part, and uh, you'll have to have some treatments, and it's probably gonna be severe. It's very poisonous. Uh, it's going to be really hard on you, and I'm sorry, you know, and, uh, you know, let all your friends and family know. And uh, we expect you back here next week, and, and we're going to start treatments, because that's the only choice. That's the only choice. If you want to live, if you want to keep your body, this is what you do. That's how I was trained. And then you have this one, and you come in and go, hmm. Your brain is up to something interesting. <laughs> I can't believe it, but it's actually it's actually trying to trying to give you a turbo testicle. <laughs> Every man's dream. Yeah. Yeah. What a difference. What a difference. So here we have this heroically, this fearfully and wonderfully made form that's, that's providing these incredible gifts. And wouldn't it be cool if we could be with that? Right? Wouldn't that be something? I mean, wouldn't that be something if the first, first look at something that, oh, you know, you know, oh, look at this. If the first thought is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, I don't get it yet, autopilot. But thank you. I know you're trying to save me from something. I don't get it yet. I'm going to get some help. We're going to see if we can sort this out. What a difference. What a difference than believing that our body has betrayed us. I mean, even in natural medicine, I tell you, 
I, I poke people's fingers. I, I look at blood on a, under a microscope on a big screen TV. And I did it day in and day out for 13 years before I could finally say this sentence. I, you know, I would look at it and I would see it and I'd go, yeah, but some smart guys told me to say this other thing. Um, do y'all know what that's like? Uh, you know, like your training, what they call training or whatever. And then they're smart guys and they really are. And, and they say that that's what something means. And you go, well, I'm kind of obligated to, you know. Um, and then one day I looked at it and I thought, oh, my God. Everyone's body is continually healing. There hasn't been anyone who's come to see me who's not healing. They're not sick. They're healing. So here's, here's our little fork in the road that we're going to come to, right? So we're all healing. Healing is the part that's uncomfortable. It turns out what Dr. Hammer discovered is when we're getting sick, when we're growing the testicular cancer, we don't feel anything at all. When we're growing a lung cancer, we don't feel anything at all. It's when the healing comes in. That's where we get fever, that's where we feel weak, that's where we feel bad. So what most of us end up being in trouble with is healing faster than we have the resources to support. Now that's been the genius of the pharmaceutical industry. You look up pharmaceutics on your etymology dictionary and it just says the word toxin. That's, <laughs> that's the original meaning. And that's it, you know? And so, you know, if you've got a runaway train, <laughs> poison the healing process. It can save your life. People can heal so fast they can die from it. Right? You gotta stop a runaway train. It's a smart thing to do. It gives a person another chance. But be clearer with the language. Tell the person, look them in the eye and say, you are a great healer. In fact, you're so good at it. <laughs> you're dangerous to yourself right now. That's how good you are. So we're going to have to just stop this runaway train and reassess everything. Now, the other option that some of the natural people have done is they say, we can fuel this train. We can get you some IV nutrients. We can put you on a better diet. We can get you in a group where you have some emotional support. We can go over to Ann's house and do a family constellation and get the blessing of your ancestors. A lot of support in that. And you all know a bunch of modalities I don't even know about, right? When we do that, we can heal really fast and be done with it without hurting ourselves. But for me, that was a huge fundamental shift to realize that people weren't sick. And, you know, people would come see me because when I was in Fredericksburg, they felt bad and they had tried every test and the doctors would say, you're absolutely fine. And it just infuriated them. And so they would come to see me and they, they'd say, I want to know what's wrong with me. And, and you can hear that collective thing. You know, I want to know what's wrong with me. And really the part that's uncomfortable is what's right with us. Everything is working great. It just doesn't feel good sometimes. And loving on each other when this is happening is huge. You know? When we're feeling like that, don't hang out there like the sheep that lost its way from the flock. Get over there with the flock. Get loved on, right? Get some support. Uh, because it's going it... to... So, everybody got that, right? Everybody got that. Okay, good. So I'm going to pause here for a second.
because we could go so many directions and they would all be great. <laughs> Isn't that cool? We could, <laughs> we could talk about so many things. Hmm. Okay. Since I brought this, you want to come up and help me with this? Uh, I'm going to slant it this way a little bit. This was uh, Dr. Hammer, our guy who had the testicular cancer and discovered all this stuff and helped 40,000 people recover from all these incredible things. Um, this is just one of his, uh, his little bits of work that he did. I just want everybody to understand how much this is actual real science. This is like a German scientist guy that did this, you know. This is, this is not uh, somebody who was living in a cave and channeled this. This is actually, <laughs> right? Which is wonderful. Hey, hey, the channelers have been ahead of the scientists for a while, you know. But I mean, this is actual, like, science for all of y'all that grew up like me. You know, if it ain't science, we don't want to hear about it. Um, and so this was Dr. Hammer's uh, work that he presented. Um, this is part of what he did. And this is called Germanic New Medicine. And he was able to show exactly which parts of the brain related with which organs and which conflicts that the person is facing that's difficult for them and which organ it shows up in. And he was actually watching people's CAT scans. People would come in and get a CAT scan so they could see if what they were working on was the right story because they could see the thing shrinking, right? So when he finally gets to present this about the mid 2000s, which to me, this is Nobel Prize worthy stuff. I mean, this is, this is what people have been looking for. This is, this is how to hook the emotions and everything we're feeling into our biology, right? Here we are in these forms, we're not lost anymore, right? He is convicted of a crime called social unrest in medicine and and he was told that that was the wrong use of the CAT scan of the brain, and he was no longer welcome in Germany. In fact, I heard he's wanted in Interpol, by Interpol, and, uh, and living in Norway was the last I heard, because they don't extradite people. But a lot of his students learned this, and the horse was out of the barn, as they say, and uh, so, these books I showed you earlier have the stories. You want to roll that back up? Okay. So, since we don't have the CAT scans of the brain, but we have these two books, and by the way, Jacques Martel is about to make his first trip to the United States. So, I can give you a number to, to call about that and get some details, but I'm planning to go. And Jobert Renault, who does the recall healing, he has a lot of YouTubes. Gilbert Renaud, YouTube, and uh, you can see a lot in recallhealing.com. So what I like to do, and I discovered it by accident. Can you say the word accident or by synchronicity? <laughs> what, whatever you all say, Love. you know, something that was totally unplanned. Um, it, there's this little device from HeartMath, and, and I'm guessing most of you all have seen it. It's called an EM wave two, stands for electromagnetic wave, and it's a second model. You can get this from Institute of Heart Math or sometimes on Amazon. Now what this little thing does is it helps a person see when their heart and their unconscious brain are doing the reprogramming dance. Now when I'm read like this, I'm kind of in the rational brain and when I said that, I'm going down into the heart and the unconscious. You can see the color change, and you can do it with a tone or just with the color. So when people come in, we, we heard about bones tonight, uh, neck bones and back bones. So we basically tape this on someone, and we have them read the story 
of what's going on in their personal or family life when a certain vertebrae is injured in an accident. And quite often, it is exactly what was going on in their life at the time of the accident. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And they get to get feedback about that. Right? So a person can actually see which parts of their own story are doing healing reprogramming of the unconscious brain and which parts are just simply about filing facts that I've learned. Right? So, let me give you a for instance. So we had a woman come in, entrepreneur, I really liked her, but she had horrible abdominal pain. So she and her beloved had gone to a foreign country, they were eating the same food, staying in the same hotels, and they both got horrible abdominal pain and diarrhea. Okay, so they went to see a doctor over there, and the doctor said, y'all picked up some kind of bug, gave him some medicine, and the man got well, but she didn't. So several weeks go by, and she's gone to every alternative person because they know, they know it's some kind of parasite. That's a creepy thing to think about, isn't it? You know, some, got some worm egg in there. You know, it's kind of disgusting, yeah. So, so she's thinking about that, you know, and uh, so she comes to see me, and, you know, I don't know what to do. I mean, she's already seen people who are smarter about worms than I am. Uh, <laughs> You know, I learned, I learned when, I, when I used to see people, I had a TV show in West Texas, Christian TV show in Odessa, and so a lot of people came to see me there, and when I would look at their blood, if I mentioned that I saw like a fluke or a little worm thing, I promise you, they did not hear a single other thing I said, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like the brain just went, went out, you know. <laughs> Yeah, worms, or, there's something about that that's really creepy. And, and so she was convinced, you know, she had the parasite because the guy she was with, he was well, he took the parasite remedy, he's well. It makes sense. But nobody can find the remedy for her. Okay, so the heart actually knows what's going on. Whether I know, whether any other doctor knows, and that's the title of the talk, The Conscious Heart Knows the Way doesn't feel that way if you grew up in public school here. <laughs> it, <laughs> you know, public school here, the answer's in the back of the book. That's where the answer is. Uh, it's not in, your, not, not in your heart, you know. Why would you look there? So we put the biofeedback monitor on her, and, and we did a, an a empty chair gestalt. And I'm betting most of y'all know what that is. Um, and since I have two chairs here, if you'll help me, I'm just going to show y'all basically what this looks like. And we'll try to keep it to where Bob can see uh, on the camera. But in an empty chair gestalt, we ask the person to face someone or something. We ask them to sit there and say, are you willing to do an imagination exercise? Because one of the beautiful things is, Whoever or whatever designed this made it to where the part of the brain that controls my body cannot tell the difference between what really happened and what I imagine. Now, there's a lot of parts of the brain that know. But for my biology and how my organs work, can't tell the difference. I can in, invent a new past if I want to, and that part of the brain cannot tell the difference, and my organs will start working differently. We're just set up that way. Okay, I think it's a great idea. I wasn't in on the planning, uh, <laughs> but you know, you know, I'll take it. Uh, so we ask her to sit there, and I can't even remember who, who she put in the other chair. Uh, but I ask people, how do you feel? What's your mood? How's your body feel? How's the abdominal pain? And so she got to talking about some things and it turned out we do these little anniversaries. So if you're taking notes, 
there's two big anniversaries that the autopilot, it repeats things in certain intervals. And when you get on the YouTube on awakeninghealth.com and you go to our media, you'll see one called Family Biology that I did at Ann's house. And you'll see the two timelines. If you do those two timelines for yourself, you can see what your automatic brain is repeating, whether you like it or not, right? So one of the things it repeats is things in doubles. So if I'm 60 years old and I have a crisis come up, it's going to be the same theme as what happened the crisis at 30. It'll be the same as what happened at 15. It'll be the same as what happened at seven and a half. And when we get down to less than nine, it either means that something happened at seven and a half months in the pregnancy or seven and a half months in the infancy. Mm -hmm. it just, that's just the way it is, right? That program sets up and it just repeats things until it's fully reconciled, until biology says, you know, we're done with that. That's no longer a biological threat. We're cool with it, right? But until then, it keeps coming back and it gets bigger each time, right? The knock on the door gets louder, kind of like the IRS or something, you know? You, you maybe get a letter the first time, and then the next time, who knows? Okay. So, it comes to her that we're on the anniversary of a day in elementary school when there was a play, and she played several parts in the play and had to change costumes. She had a mentally ill older brother who beat her, and the parents were alcoholic and were ineffective in keeping her safe. So that day, when the teacher took off the one costume and put on the new one, there was this huge bruise on her abdomen where her brother had kicked her. And she never said anything about those things, right? She just kept it secret. And so when I heard that story, I asked her if she would be willing to visualize her brother in the empty chair. And she said yes. And so she's sitting there. We asked her about her pain level. And all I did was take the chair that she was imagining him in, and I scooted it a little bit closer to her, and her pain level shot up. And at that moment, she got it. I didn't have to say or do anything else. After that first shock of pain, she started laughing. She said, oh my God, that's what this is. She was free of pain. It was her way of remembering this event. That's why the parasite remedy didn't work. And, and after her laughing, we did some sentences of rejoining with brother, something to heal that. And she was fine when she left. So that's one of the, the polarity tools I was fortunate to learn. I'll tell you a second one since we have the chairs here. A woman came and she was 50 and she had had fibromyalgia for 10 years. What, what happened 10 years ago when this started, there was a big accident and I was injured. Okay, so at 40, there was this big accident. Now we know that we can't go back and change an accident. It, it happened, the bones were broken, whatever happened, we can't change that. So, I also knew from, from learning this with Jobert Renault, he said he has, has yet to see a fibromyalgia that is not related to molestation or rape. And to stay with that until you find where that is. It was not difficult. I, I said, you had this accident at 40. I said, what happened at 20? So we know the brain repeats on doubles. She just said, I was raped. So what we did, we asked her to first to bring her higher self here until she felt safe. And then 
to visualize the man who raped her. And they had a conversation, a real conversation. Like, what did you want to say to him? What did he not hear you say? What did you try to do and you weren't powerful enough to do it? <coughs> Let's feel that and go back into that scene. And she did that. And then she left. I get a call the next day that during the night, strange experience happened to her, but it was like this sensation of something kind of twisting and leaving her body. And the pain went away. This is what we're talking about. It's like the brain, when there's something that's overwhelming psychologically, she could not face that in the moment. But now, at twice that age, she can. She has the tools to do it. She has the maturity to do it. She can face this guy. She can finish this. Her brain knew that. That's why it brought it up. The brain is brilliant. It is never wrong. It might feel bad but it's never wrong. She healed in just a few minutes, recognizing the beauty of how this works. Something's overwhelming, it's gonna get sent down into the body. How many of you are pretty sure that you are the first pregnancy for your parents? How many people? If you feel like you can stand up, if you'd go ahead and stand up. People who, people who are number, <laughs> feel like you're the first pregnancy for your parents. Well, you know how wonderful, huh? What a good group. Uh, okay, and just keep standing up. Yeah, yeah, it's the first pregnancy, not necessarily the first birth, but you're the first pregnancy. Okay, how many people in here are the fourth pregnancy for their parents? Number four. Yeah, go ahead and stand up if you would, okay. And do we have anyone who is a seven or a 10 or beyond that? Seven or a 10? Or beyond. If you're beyond, I'll work with you. I'm eight. You're eight, okay. So a four, a ones, fours, and sevens. Anybody a seven? Okay. In family biology, ones, fours, and sevens share similar autopilot settings in their brain. I just wanted you to stand up so you would remember it. Y'all can look around at the ones, fours, and sevens. So ones, fours, and sevens in a family, they share autopilot settings, okay? If y'all want to sit down. How many of y'all are the second pregnancy for your family? Yeah, if y'all want to stand up, whoever the, the number twos here. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, number twos. How about number fives? Who was the fifth, anybody the fifth pregnancy? How about number eight? I know we have an eight there. Uh -huh. And anybody beyond that, like an 11 or a 14? Okay, so twos, fives, and eights, your auto autopilot <coughs> has similar settings. This is one of the reasons it's tough for siblings to get along. You know, we, you know, we, we have different autopilot settings and we can't believe how we have the same parents and we see things so differently. Okay, so if y'all would sit down. How about people who were third? Who's the third pregnancy? Okay, all right. All right, so three, how about sixes? Do we have anybody who's a six? I have a question, what about like twins? Would that count as one pregnancy? Okay, identical or non? Identical. Yeah, go ahead and, go ahead and, yeah. Just count yourself either way on the identical twins, yeah. And, and then what you do is look up the family tree, and I can tell you how to do that later. Um, okay, so three sixes and nines. Sorry, what about, about miscarriages? Sixes? Yeah, miscarriages count. Uh-huh, yeah, so, yeah, they count as a pregnancy. So three sixes and nines also share autopilot settings, right? So when we look up the family tree, we notice that we have similarities with other people who are three sixes and nines in y'all's cases. 
Okay. So if y'all want to sit back down there. And that can really help us when we talk about belonging. And I want to talk about the autopilot and how important the sense of belonging is. The nervous system that's in me that this heart math monitor measures, that heart rate variability measures, you all have heard of sympathetic and parasympathetic, the autonomic nervous system. Have you ever looked up the, the etymology of those words? So when you go on edamonline.com, it's the online etymological dictionary, and you look up the word sympathetic, I thought I knew what it meant. But you know how words, when people originally craft a word, they have an idea in mind, right? This word pathetic, it comes from the word pathos, which I thought, that's pathology, that's disease. It's not. It means what befalls us. And when you put S-Y-M in front of it, it means what befalls us together. Now, what we've learned in family constellations and when we do family trees is that the nervous system that's physically in my body doesn't belong to me. It actually is shared with, for sure, the last three generations of the family tree. We can prove that over and over and over. My autonomic nervous system, my autopilot, will fire on the anniversary of my grandfather's death. It's just going to do it. If you haven't made your calendar into a family calendar, you're missing some insights. I never met Lincoln. I never met Washington. And they're on all my calendars. Isn't that amazing? It just come that way. Like, oh, I'm supposed to think that's really important. <laughs> Now, with grandparents and parents, it doesn't matter what the order is. We always get grandparents and parents. The order is for aunts and uncles and great aunts and great uncles. Mm -hmm. So I started writing down the dates of when my grandparents were born and died. And you will be surprised what you find yourself doing and thinking on those days. And for me now, it's nice to wake up and look at that at the beginning of the day and think something kind. Like, hey, Grandpa, I see you were born today. And you know, text all your cousins, you know, and, and everybody's in on it, and there's this feeling of belonging. This feeling of belonging is so vital to us that we would rather die of an illness than lose our sense of belonging. One of my constellation teachers, Stefan Hausner, wrote a book. It said, it's entitled, Even If It Cost Me My Life. He watched so many constellations where people would walk right into death out of loyalty to the program that was downloaded in the womb in the first year of life. In biology, we cannot lose belonging. So what Ann helps with, and come on the 18th, it's going to be at noon. I go every time. I know Chuck and Karen come. Several other people in here come. That can be renegotiated. And so what happens in families sometimes, like my grandfather's first wife died in childbirth. Um, I didn't know that was any kind of big deal. I mean, you know, I mean, I didn't know her. And he was killed before I was born. So, you know, what could that have to do with anything? But you would be surprised. I was surprised at the shift in myself and my family when we did a constellation and allowed love to flow in. There, there were crazy ideas and feelings around sex. It's been documented when something like this happens that males for three to four generations will feel like sex is a murder weapon. That's what's running in the subconscious. 
I can't fully give myself to a woman that I love and have a child with her because she will die. Now, when that's running unconsciously, I'm just driven by that. I will, I will go like this. All the kids in my family did that. Some of them decided, we're not even going to get married in the first place. We're not going to have kids. We're not going to get married. And we make up stories about why we're doing that. But really, why we're doing that is there's this unresolved sense in there that my loving somebody is lethal for them, right? And that is my origin story. That's where I come from, right? So when that gets shifted, there can be an ease about my own sexuality and that of the other grandchildren. There can be a sense where I can take and hold a woman and be okay about that. I don't have to be in constant fear and anxiety. So that's what happens at a family constellation. So I would encourage you to come. They're free to come and observe. You may get asked to represent someone's sister, you know, or someone's daughter, and you can say yes or no. But it's a beautiful thing to see want to come and, and visit with me, and it can be done in person or over the phone. We will draw a family tree if you want. We'll talk about your issue. We'll let you see your own heart biofeedback. Mark Wolin is calling these now family traumagrams and is doing an international tour. If you haven't read his book called It Didn't Start With You, Pick that book up on audiobook. It's the closest thing to a workbook for family constellations. It'll, it'll help a person get started. What about children who are adopted and have no knowledge of what you're discussing? Yes, so thank you. That's a great question. And so when someone is adopted or has no knowledge of what's going on, one of the tools, of course, is a family constellation because we'll ask people to stand in for the biological parents. And the energy of that can shift. And that's a powerful one. Um, in a way, biologically, if a person is adopted on the first day of their life, they are a biological orphan. And, and they will relive that on a daily basis until that's reprogrammed. It, if they're adopted at three months of age, it comes back again. Every three months, they're going to feel whatever they feel that's related to that event and that can be shifted. Mm -hmm. I did a constellation once for a family where they had, they had a three-year-old child. They adopted an <coughs> They had a three-year-old child and they, they had adopted at 18 months of age from um, Kazakhstan. And the only thing they knew was the mother was Kazakhstani and the father was Russian. It's the only thing they knew. But the child would wake up every single night screaming in terror. And these were wise parents, and they had done every possible thing and were not able to resolve the problem. We did a constellation. We brought in the biological father and mother, the adoptive parents, and the child. <coughs> and there was this big energy vacuum at the other end of the room. We put somebody there, and it turned out to be the grandmother, who herself had had um, to marry because she was pregnant and she was unhappy with her marriage and now her daughter is pregnant without being married and she is both resentful and loving of her daughter and she wants the daughter not to have a child to force her into marriage. The daughter doesn't want this kid. The father of the daughter, the biological father, and we don't know if he ever met the child, we don't know. But he was so emotionally connected to the child, and the child was so emotionally connected with him that they were both bereft. And we had the biological father ask the adoptive father to deliver his love to his daughter. Mm -hmm. That night, the child didn't cry, and she never cried again at night. Yes. <laughs> and that's what we've seen when we have people standing in so it's quite a service if you decide to come and either observe or stand in. You can be of incredible service to people to stand in for someone's biological father or mother who they never met. And these huge energy shifts, they make a difference in our biology and the way we live our lives 
and how much or how little we suffer. So I'll tell you the first one I saw, and, and it was, I was, uh, had a chelation clinic, and I was doing IVs and looking at blood, and, and a Mennonite farmer came in with a big, huge abdominal tumor. And he wanted me to help him, and I thought, oh boy, I, was, I, was, I knew I was out of my league, I don't know anything about this, you know. And the way the story worked, when we got into the story is, the tumor started growing after his final daughter, the number four, left for college. So I ask about it, well there was a fifth child, a fifth daughter, but she died shortly after birth. And as soon as this came up, the man looked down and would not look up again. The wife said, he believes he didn't take good enough care of me during the pregnancy, and that's why the child died. And so we ended up doing just a very brief ritual where I stood in for the deceased child, and I asked the parents to stand behind me and put their arms around each other and put one hand on my head and say the sentences that parents say when they bless children. And they wept like babies. I, and I was frightened, honestly. I'd never done that before. And after about five minutes, they left. In a month, the tumor was completely gone. And he came back six months later to show me how happy he was with his wife. And I can remember being so nervous because I had no idea what happened. Um, but I was happy they were well, but it was like, I stood kind of at a distance. I wasn't sure what to do. And, you know, I, I, it was as nice and polite as I could put a face on for. But I saw something that I never had seen in my life before. And it's since happened many, many times. Once the family heart opens, once I'm in the line of that love, whether I ever knew them or not, or whether it's through people representing them, once I'm in the line of that love, everything changes. All the biology changes. It gets happy. It gets unburdened. It gets easy. So, mm -hmm. How does this work with children who have gone through terrific traumas? Terrific traumas. Like what you're describing to me sounds like, yes, life that happens in many different ways. But mm -hmm. I'm talking about dark things that have happened. Yes. Yeah. So when we work with people, it's all going to be individual. You know, there, there are some patterns that recur over and over, like we talked about, people repeating things in doubles, their brain will, uh, and the ones, fours, and sevens, and things like that. But for any given purpose, a person, it's more about what they held in secret at the time of the trauma. We're only as sick as our secrets. And our brain, when we're faced with a big trauma, it will hide something inside of us. We have a way out. We're not going to stay there for that. We're hiding. And it's a smart thing to do. And then there comes a time for that to come out. Could you mention something about how we speak? over a child's bed when they're sleeping? Uh, yes, okay, thank you. So working with a child, if a child is just reaching puberty or younger, um, so, all right, so I've told this one before, so I might as well say it. Mm. Um, so I was impatient one night, it was uh, the fifth day after my wife's period, we figured she wasn't fertile, um, don't need to, you know, have any birth control and uh, conceived twins. And I was a medical student with no money at the time. And uh, so now we have twins. And another child. Yes, and we already had one child. And so in honor of that origin story, neither one of these girls did math. They could not calculate. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Now, if I had known what I know now, we stand over the bed while they're sleeping and we tell them, oh, honey, <laughs> it was daddy that couldn't calculate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, and you have my blessing to do math or not do math the way you want to. Uh -huh. Have you worked with those with Alzheimer's? So with Alzheimer's, when it's severe, so here's, here's the first question we, we ask ourselves when somebody comes in, and it can, it can feel harsh, but at least this is how I'm thinking. Why is shutting down this person's memory the very best survival strategy they can come up with. Why is that? When we discover why that is, because the brain itself is shutting off its own memory. It's doing it on purpose. Now we can fight against that and struggle against that, but it works so much better if we start out by going, hey, I don't get this. This is really painful. But you know, I'm just going to say thanks because I know how this works and thanks for saving me from something and I'm going to get some help and find out what this is. Why you're shutting down your own memory. And so when we start there, it's amazing what can come out. And when a person's memory feels welcome again, it's different than fighting an illness. It, you know, fighting things makes the side of the nervous system that's about fight, flight, or freeze, that's not the healing side, really. That's stirring up a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so what about this person who just killed himself in San Antonio? What about mental disease? So, so the, my instructor, and he tells this story, if you ever get a chance to take a class from Jobert Renault and Recall Healing, it's, it's really exceptional. So his father was mentally ill. And when he found out that his wife was pregnant with him, he went to the store and bought three bullets for his rifle. Once for the, one for the pregnant mother, one for the daughter he already had, and one for himself. He was intercepted on the way home. The wife went and got him at five months of the pregnancy out of the mental institution. And as Jobert would say, he could never gain weight. He always stayed skinny and small until he reprogrammed something. Can you, can you guess why he stayed small? Pregnancy doesn't grow. Pregnancy you're harder to hit with a bullet if you're small. If you're a target, you want to be as small as possible. And then when we look at the mental illness that shows up in a small person with a violent father, depression is the perfect solution. Can you see that? Because if you stand up and fight, you're going to die. Biology does not allow that. So what it will do is it will instantly change the shape of the hormone receptors so that a person is neither male nor female. They're not an alpha male and they're not an alpha female. If the brain chooses depression as a strategy, that's what happens. And there are stories as well for bipolar and schizophrenia. In schizophrenia, we've seen it reverse with family constellations and it's typically about where one family member murders another family member several generations back. And this person's automatic brain inherited the victim and the perpetrator autopilot in the same brain. And they have to be loyal to both. And they don't know how to do it. And the only way to do it is to split a personality off. So when that murder energy is reenacted, it can bring wholeness to that person. Everything that we have is the brain's best solution in the moment for us to survive. If, if you can get that one piece and 
these people are documenting tens of thousands of recoveries from things that we just thought were, oh, these are incurable. They're not a disease in the first place. They're just called that by a misunderstanding. There's nothing going on with us except love or blocked love. I mean, that's, that's basically it. Rich, we have time for one more question. Okay. What can we do to help you get this message out to the public? Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, a good question, Ed. So if anybody has any ideas, eventually I'd like to see this be middle school biology. <laughs> you know, because sustainable cultures do an initiation at puberty. They know this autopilot is running and that everybody has this thing in them that will run them until they die if the village doesn't help them hand it back to their parents and grandparents. So if we got this out in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I think we could accomplish some of that. Um, and in, in the meantime, yeah, I, I would be willing to do some, some classes and help some people get, get started. But if you have some ideas about how to do something with it, um, it can be taught in kind of a very structured way and, uh, and also is a lot of fun. Once, once people get into it, they can impersonate the pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Yeah, you just, you just haven't lived until you've impersonated a pancreas, right? Uh, so. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks for coming out. I hope we can do it again sometime. <laughs>